All right, so welcome to CPPCon. I'm Bryce edelstein Lalback. I'm the program chair. I uh, work at the Computer Architecture Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is a U.S. Department of Energy research facility in California. And uh, I develop parallel programming frameworks and analyze software performance and research next generation hardware technologies. Uh, I'm a member of the Stellar Group and one of the developers of the HPX parallel runtime system. Uh, if some of you were in the, this room for the last talk, uh, uh, that was from Hartmut, my colleague, uh, who was also one of the HPX developers. And so today I'm going to talk to you about the new parallel algorithms that will tentatively be in the C++17 uh, standard. So I'm not really going to talk about how particular compiler vendors might implement the parallel algorithms. Um, the reason for that is the parallel algorithm library was designed as a way for programmers to request parallelization and constraints in that parallelization. And the interface was designed to be agnostic to the implementation. So in my talk today, I'm going to also be agnostic to the implementation. I'm going to focus on how you'd use the parallel algorithms library. I'm going to really focus on the interface. I'm not going to talk too much about sort of um, the details aside from what the constraints mean. Um, if you're interested in looking at a particular implementation, I'd recommend HPX. I'm a little biased, though. So something like Thrust or Boost uh, Compute are other implementations. Um, the parallel algorithms library has not yet been implemented in any of the major uh, C++ standard libraries, but uh, we'll probably start to see implementations in the next year or so, given that it's right now in the committee draft uh, for the 17 standard. So I'm first going to talk about why we need parallel algorithms in C++. So in 2012, Sean Parent gave a keynote at C++ Now. And during that talk, he said, uh, without addressing vectorization, GPU computing, and scalable parallelism, standard C++ is just a scripting system to get the other 99% of the machine through other languages and libraries. And he showed this slide. Um, and so this, this slide, is his intention was to demonstrate that prior to C++17, you can only utilize a small percentage of your hardware with only standard C++ and nothing else. Now, just adding threading would get you a little bit, it's maybe a little hard to see this pointer here, but you can see this little pink region right here. That's what you get from, from just threading. But you lose all of this here from not utilizing vectorization, from not utilizing any accelerators that you might have. So a lot of you may be familiar with Herb Sutter's article, Free Lunch is Over, from, from a few years ago, which described the end of CPU frequency growth and the rise of multi-core -process, multi processors and how we needed to adapt. We needed to start thinking about parallelism in software that previously didn't need to have parallelism because parallelism was the new way that you would get additional performance. And we have adapted to that. Um, but now we're reaching the end of CPU core growth. It's becoming harder and harder to add additional cores to traditional cache coherent uh, heavyweight CPU designs. So we're starting to move towards lightweight cores, uh, SMPD uh, processing, so GPUs type processing, um, other types of accelerators, specialized accelerators, um, on-package FPGAs, on-package high bandwidth memory technologies like MCD RAM and, and HMC. And so what all this means is that free lunch is over again. So now we have to sort of adapt to a whole new set of things. And this time it's worse because the hardware is both increasingly parallel and increasingly diverse. So now we've reached a point where we're starting to move towards specialization of we're going to have this, this hardware that's going to be very specialized for this type of task. And so it's very difficult to sort of write portable software that can run on multiple modern systems and really fully utilize them today. So what we really need is vendor-neutral parallel programming abstractions that can target multiple different uh, architectures and systems without leaving performance on the table. So in C++11 and 14, we have low-level concurrency primitives. We don't really have any higher-level generic abstractions for parallel programming, and that's what the parallel algorithms library adds. But before I get into that, I first want to talk about what it's based on, which is the standard algorithms library. So this was a, qu a question that I came across. It was one of the first things when I was putting together this slides was, well, what are, what are standard algorithms? So the standard says that the algorithms library describes components that C++ programs may use to perform algorithmic operations on containers and other sequences. So, so that sort of seems fundamental, that it's these, these algorithms that they operate on sequences. So what are they? They're generic operations on sequences. 
but there's a caveat that there's some things that are in the algorithm header that don't operate on sequences, but let's just ignore those for now. It's just standard algorithms are these generic operations on sequences. So there's three types of these operations. So there's non-modifying sequence operations like for each and find. There's mutating sequence operations like transform and copy. There's sorting and related operations, so things like sort and, and binary search. So the new parallel algorithms library provides parallelized versions of these sequence operations, and it's going to tentatively be in C++ 17, as I said. It's right now it's in the committee draft, um, which which means that it's it's very likely going to be in there. There may be some bug fixes that go in. Um, okay, so. What do I mean by parallel? So, as I said, there's a lot of different types of parallelism and a lot of different types of parallel hardware. And on most platforms expose different types of parallelism and multiple types of parallelism. So there's, I like to think of five basic levels of parallelism. So the bit level of parallelism is, is parallelism exposed by the word size that individual hardware components operate on. This is, this is implicit, you almost never see this directly in your software. You don't have to think about this frequently. The people who make hardware think about this for you. Instruction level parallelism is the parallelism exposed through the simultaneous execution of instructions. You mostly don't have to think about this unless you're somebody like me who has to sweat cycles very frequently and has to think about how does the branch predictor um, going to function in this particular piece of software. But usually, the idea is that instruction level parallelism is also hidden from you, that magical hardware smarts will just sort of make it all work under the hood. The vector level parallelism is parallelism which is exposed by instructions and hardware units that operate on multiple words simultaneously. So this is sort of the middle ground. Um, you get a good amount of vector, par vector parallelism from auto-vectorizing compilers, but if you really want to ensure that you've got good vectorization, you have to go out of your way to address it in some way explicitly. Maybe you just need to give your compiler some hints, so it's not like fully explicit, but just like hint it like, hey, here's some suggestions that will help you know that you can vectorize this code. Then there's task-level parallelism, which is parallelism that you, is exposed through the simultaneous execution of tasks that are communicating in some fashion and that share a primary address space. And then finally, there's process-level parallelism, which is parallelism exposed through the simultaneous execution of different processes which communicate via messages or shared memory regions and don't have a, a shared address space. And so sort of at the bottom here, this is very explicit, and at the top here, it's very implicit. So the parallel algorithms library today provides vector and task-level parallelism. So in the future, it might provide process-level parallelism, like distributed computing support. But for right now, it provides these two levels, and that's sort of what we need. These top two levels are not something that you really need to explicitly address at all in your software. So there's five main components to the parallel algorithms library. First of all, there's this concept of, a, of an execution policy that I'm going to get to in a minute. Then there's three standard um, types that, that implement that concept. Then there are the, the algorithms themselves. So they come in, the ones that are just versions of the existing algorithms, they come in the form of new overloads that take an execution policy as their first parameter. And then there are some new unordered algorithms that are based on existing ordered algorithms. Basically, these algorithms are algorithms where the, the wording of the serial version would prohibit us from vectorizing, from parallelizing it. So we've created, added a new version that has slightly different wording that relaxes some of the, the um, guarantees about the ordering of operations and would allow us to parallelize them. And then we have fused algorithms, which are combinations of other algorithms which, by combining them, we're able to create a more efficient implementation than we would otherwise have. All right, so let's start off with execution policies. So an execution policy describes how a generic algorithm may be parallelized. They allow programmers to request parallelism and to describe the constraints on parallelism. So what type of parallelism would I like? And I don't mean that in terms of like saying like I would like you to use my GPU. What you say is like I would like like these this sort these sorts of operations are okay. Like this you can do this sort of thing to my code and it will be all right. And then whatever the implementation is under the hood will figure out, you know, oh I can use this or I can do this or I can do this. So there's three standard ones that it, that I mentioned. So there's std seek, std par and std par on seek. So std seek is mainly there for um, debugging. It is a policy that specifies that operations will be indeterminately sequenced in the calling thread. So indeterminately sequenced just means that they will, they will be sequenced in some order. We won't tell you what, but that, that order will hold. And that it'll only be in the calling thread. There will be no new threads created. So it's just serial, basically. 
Then there's std par, which says operations are indeterminately sequenced with respect to each other within the same thread. So std par says paralyze, but please do not vectorize. Std par on seek says operations are unsequenced with respect to each other and possibly interleaved, and there's special magical language there. And that magical language is what lets us have a library functionality that uh, supports vectorization, because the special language says, hey, you can do some magic and like interleave these functions in ways that normally you wouldn't be allowed to do this with like just some function object that somebody gave you, but it's all right here. And so that's saying I want both parallelism and I want vectorization. So both, both task parallelism and uh, vector uh, level parallelism. So uh, let's look at an example of how these two are different. So how par, C, par and par and seek are different. So suppose that we want to use the following binary operation, this multiply here with the std transform. So we've got some input here. Um, and so basically what we want to do is we want to do xi equals xi times y for each iteration of these two different sequences. There may be vectors. So let's sort of compile this to sort of a pseudo assembly here. So what does this look like? Well, we're going to load xi to some scalar register. Then we're going to load yi to some scalar register. Then we're going to multiply these two together. And we're going to store the result in xi. So with std par, you get something like this, where you have, we've got multiple iterations. And maybe each one is executed on a different uh, thread. But they will not be interleaved at all. That each one will, will be just, it'll be treated like a regular function. It'll, it'll be, each step of it will be executed in sequence. What std par, what std par and seek says is, you're allowed to both interleave and to run these things in multiple threads. So like one thing we could do is we could say, hey, let's move all the loads of x up here to the top and all the loads of y up here and all of the multiplies here and all the stores down here. And then with vector instructions, we could reduce that down to something like this where we say, hey, load a vector's worth of x's, load a vector's worth of y's, and then multiply those two vectors of data together and then store the results to this location there. And so again, this is possible because we've allowed this, this unleave, interleaving here. And OK, the next component is all of these new overloads. So these are all of the um, existing algorithms that have uh, overloads. The table of ones that don't have parallel overloads is probably more useful, but unfortunately, I don't have it. So most of them have it. There's a couple exceptions. It, for example, the ordered algorithms that we can't parallelize. Those don't have overloads, so like accumulate is missing here, for example. Um, inner product is missing here, for example. And there, there's, there's a couple others, so like there's obviously there's no parallel min or max. Um, and I've, I've highlighted sort of the most useful ones. So for each, sort, and transform are particularly useful uh, uh, ones in a parallel context. So one thing to note about for each is that it's a little different in the parallel version. The serial version returns the urinary function argument that's the input. The parallel version does not, because that's not really something that would, that would work for, for a parallel for each. So using these is pretty easy. So like this is parallel sort. You just, here's a vector. Hey, sort it. First argument's going to be an execution policy. It will be sorted in some way in parallel. So for each here, what we're saying is say par and seek. For this, and what I'm saying here with the with the unseek is I'm saying, hey, I'm giving you this function process, and you can go and like decompose it and interleave it and do crazy stuff under the hood so that you can vectorize it, and that's all right. Now, if if for whatever reason that was going to be a problem for me and that was going to break my code, I could just change this to par, and then it would be fine. So this is roughly equivalent to this. So pragma OMP parallel for SIMD. It just looks much nicer, and it's an actual C++ construct. All right, so then there's the new unordered algorithms that are based on um, ordered algorithms. So std reduce, which is an unordered accumulate. There's std inclusive scan and exclusive scan, which are unordered partial sums. And then there's transform reduce, which is an unordered inner product. So these are um, also some of the more useful ones that pretty much all of the examples will, will use these algorithms. These are the components of the parallel algorithms like library you're most likely to use with the exception of sort also being fairly useful in, the, in, in this context. All right, so first let's start with, with std reduce. So as I said, it's, it's an unordered accumulate. The interface is the same. So first you've got the execution policy, then you've got some input sequence. Then you have the initial value for the uh, reduction, which is applied for the first element. And then you have this binary op. 
and that binary op is a callable that's going to be applied to consecutive elements, and it's also going to be applied to other invocations of the op. So it's like it'll do like a tree structure. Um, and by default, that's that's stood uh, plus, and the init value there by, is by default just the default constructed t. So the differences between std accumulate and std reduce is, is this. So std accumulate says, hey, first you create some temporary, some value ACC of type t and initialize it with that initial value. Then for, for every iterator in this range, in order, go and apply this operation here of applying the binary operator um, to, to this here. And so you can see here that this is not, you couldn't parallelize this because every iteration depends on the previous iteration. So what std reduce says is it says this thing. It says do this g sum thing of this binary op and then init and first. So before we get into what that is, um, we have to step aside and take a, a quick uh, math review. So the reason for that is because the difference between reduce and accumulate is that uh, with reduce, you'll get a non-deterministic result for a non-associative or non-commutative op, like floating point addition is not, uh, not commutative and not associative. So that you might get a non-deterministic result here if you just did std reduce with uh, just floats or doubles. So this is the quick math review. We're at math review. So commutivity means that changing the order of operations does not change the result. Addition, multiplication, or commutative subtraction is not. Associativity means that the grouping of operations does not change the result. So again, addition and multiplication for integers is associative and subtraction is not. For floating point types, they're not because the, the order of operations may change, uh, may, may determine how many you know, bits get cut off in certain places. All right, so let's go back to that G sum thing. But first, I've got to define another weird, ambiguous operation, which is this thing. So this is GN sum, which stands for generalized non-commutative sum. So we've got, it takes two arguments, really. It takes an op, some operator, and then a sequence of things. And it's a piecewise function. So if the number of things in the sequence is one, then this operation just returns the, the thing in the sequence, the, whatever the one argument was. But otherwise, what it does is it, it will go and it'll do two recursive calls on some subsequence of the input, and the, the partition point can be arbitrary. So that it, it, it could be just like two elements, it could be like half the elements, it could be whatever. And then it will call the operator on the result of the two recursive calls here. And then, of course, those recursive calls could also recurse down, so they could have some tree structure. And again, as I said, that k there is arbitrary. So this is the generalized non-commutative sum. So the other thing, g sum, the generalized sum, uh, that is what we, how we specify reduce, is very similar. What it basically just says is that it's the same thing as the generalized non-commutative sum, but it can, re it can permute the elements in the sequence. So the, uh, the difference is that this here is unspecified for non-commutative ops. So GN sum is unspecified for non-commutative ops, but it's not, uh, it's fine for non-associative ops. G sum here is, un it will give you some unspecified result for both non-associative non and non-commutative ops. So this is why reduce gives you a non-deterministic result for non-commutative and non-associative ops, because it's, it's, this is how it's, it's worded. So what does this mean? Well, so if you've got this here, if I've got some vector and I want to accumulate it, it's very straightforward what actually happens. If we would just want to like inline this function in our head, we would just do this, right? So we've got these five elements here where we want to accumulate them. Okay, well, we've got some initial value here, zero. So that's what the initial value is here. And then for each iteration, we just sort of add on to it. Straightforward. Okay, so with reduce, this is one of the possible things that could happen, but there are many other possible things that could happen. So you could get this, but you could also get this, because it's allowed to permute, the, the, per, the order in which the elements are, are operated on could be permuted, so that it could go, hey, let's deal with the second one, then the first one, then the third one, then, then the last one, then the fourth one. And also, it can do this, it, it can sort of split things off into trees and do this recursive um, partitioning of, of the workload. So that you could say, hey, go do this in one task over here, go do this in another task over here, and then come and combine them together later. 
and then also this 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 could also be uh, so this is like this is an ordered. Oh no, I'm looking at the wrong side. Okay, this is like this is ordered, and there could also be unordering here as well. All right, pretty straightforward, ish. Any questions on reduce? Okay, right there. So, so the question was, do you guarantee that it will be one of the possible orders plus one of the possible associations? Um, I believe the answer to that is yes, because the result is, it's unspecified, but not undefined behavior. So it will, it's, some unspecified things happens, but I might be wrong about that. I'm pretty sure I'm not, but it's something I'll have to look up later. Okay. All right, so next, let's talk about inclusive scan. So inclusive scan is an unordered partial sum. So it has the same interface as partial sum. So again, it's just got, it's got the execution for, uh, uh, policy parameter. Then it's got some input sequence specified as a first and last iterator. Then there's another sequence, in, uh, an output sequence. And for the output sequence, we only have, we only have one iterator that's given. And then it's just assumed that, that it's going to be the, the same size as the input sequence. And then you've got an op. And that op is a binary callable that's going to be applied to consecutive elements in the results of other invocations and also possibly the initial value. And then we have an initial value. So the difference between inclusive scan and partial sum is that inclusive scan applies the op with unspecified grouping. So it gives a non-deterministic result for non-associative ops, but it's fine for non-commutative ops. So it's, it's, it's a GN sum is used in defining this, not G sum. So slightly different from reduced there. So what this actually looks like, so this is like what partial sum or, or inclusive scan looks like. So the first um, element of the output is just equal to the first element of the input. The second is equal to the, the first element of the input plus the second element of the input, and so on and so forth, and so on. So it's a, it accumulates the sum of all the previous um, iterations there. So exclusive scan is something that we didn't previously have a corresponding unordered version. It's just like inclusive scan, but it uh, excludes the ith element in the ith sum. So what I mean by that is that like the, the first output is just equal to the init initial value here. And like the second output here is just equal to the, whatever the initial value is plus the first element. It does not include the corresponding element, so the second element of the input in the sum there. And it's particularly useful um, for a number of these uh, parallel programming problems, which is why it's added. And there, there's now a corresponding um, non-execution policy-based overload of this exclusive scan, too. But it's sort of, it's very similar to a partial sum or inclusive scan. All right, and so then we have the fused algorithms. And the last of the fused, the first of the fused algorithms here, transform reduce, is also one of these algorithms that maps directly to an unordered um, algorithm, which is inner product. So there's transform reduce, there's transform inclusive scan, and transform exclusive scan. So transform reduce is by far the most powerful of these. In fact, this talk probably shouldn't be called this. It should probably just be called transform reduce, because that's pretty much all that I do here, is just show you how to use transform reduce. It's a very, very, very useful algorithm. So it looks like this. Um, okay, that should not say unordered transform reduce. It should say unordered inner product there. My apologies for that. All right, so transform reduce, it takes its execution policy as the first parameter here. And then it takes some input sequence, so a first last pair. Then it takes a transformation operator, a urinary transformation operator. And then it takes some initial value and then a reduction operator here. Now, it's important to note what the types are of this transform operator, this urinary transform operator, and this binary reduction operator. So here's what the signatures look like. So the transform operator looks like this. So it's, it takes some t, the type of the input sequence, and it returns some type r of whatever type it would like. And then the reduction operator takes two types r and combines them into one type r. So what, when I, we say transform reduce, it's to, if you want to think about what it does, it's very simple. It's just transform, then reduce. So what it does is it applies the it applies the urinary transform op to each element in the range first last, then it reduces the result with the reduction operator. So transform, then reduce. Now, it is of course a little confusing because the way that you see it in code is you, like this, reduce and then transform if you sort of are writing it out in your head. 
but the, oper the order in which the operations happens is the transformation is applied to the input and then the reduction is applied. One important thing to note is that usually when you think about transform, you think about it as a mutating sort of thing. The transform, the serial version, right, it has some output sequence that it, that it, it writes to. There is no output sequence for the transform here. The value, there's a, this transform sequence that gets created, but it's sort of like a pseudo sequence. It's sort of created on the fly and it's immediately consumed by the reduction op. And so this is where you get the, the benefit from, from instead of just doing a transform separately and a reduce separately, that there's no temporary sequence created here. All right, so like this is what it looks like. So at the, at the base level, the fir first thing it's done is the transform op gets applied to the input sequence. And then the reduction op gets used to combine um, multiple transformed values. And then it also gets used to combine multiple reduced values. And so the tree actually would look a lot larger than this, potentially. All right. So there is a, again, this slide should say, unordered std, trans, std inner product here. So there's also a binary um, version of transform reduced. There's a caveat here, which is that the spec is currently missing the binary version, but I think I'm going to be able to fix that. So I'm go the rest of these slides assume that the binary overload for transform reduce is gonna make it into the standard. Um, I'm pretty confident that this is something that we'll be able to fix. I think it's really just a naming uh, issue because there actually, it's specified in the standard that there is a parallel inner product. And that doesn't make a lot of sense because we can't parallelize inner product. So really, what we really just need to do is rename the parallel inner product to transform, to transform reduce. So the, the, I call this the binary transform reduce. So the distinction between the version I just showed you is that this takes a binary transform operation and it works on two input sequences. So the binary transform operation is applied to consecutive pairs from the two input sequences. The first input sequence is the first one, last one sequence, and then the second input sequence is the sequence that starts with first two. And so the transform op will be applied to pairs of elements from those two sequences, and then the reduction operation uh, gets applied uh, in the way that we just, I just showed you. So, all right, I'm gonna get to some examples now. So suppose that we have some sequence x and we wanna compute its vector norm. So the vector norm is the square root of the sum of the square of each element. So that's a little wordy, but basically we take each element, we square it, we sum all those elements together, and then we take the square root of that. So you should be able to see sort of like how this is an inner product, because there's, there's, two, there's two different operations here that we're doing. So this is, we're gonna use an urinary transform reduce here, and the reason for that, we, we've just got um, one input sequence, x. We're gonna do some urinary transform on it, and it's gonna be this, so just a square function, so that's, the middle one there, right there. Sorry, my laser pointer does not seem to be functioning. Oh, maybe it is. All right, so here's our urinary op. And then the reduction op is just gonna be addition here. Um, so, and so it's just, the, it's just gonna reduce the left value and the right value here. And then the initial reduction value is just gonna be zero. So this is pretty straightforward, and then we just take the square root of this whole thing. So this is parallel vector norm with the parallel algorithms I breathe. It's pretty easy to read, it's pretty straightforward. Kind of like it. All right, so let's talk. Ooh, are these slides out of order? They are slightly out of order. Don't worry about that. Okay. All right, so dot product. So this is the um, sort of canonical transform reduce example. If you were in Hartman's talk, I, I, I haven't looked over Hartman's slides, but I suspect there was probably a dot product example in there. I feel confident in saying that there was a dot product example in the last talk because that's just the example that you use for transform reduce. So dot product is you've got two different vectors and you want to go and take, for each consecutive pair of elements, you want to multiply them together and then you want to take the sum of all of those products. So like it's x0 times y0 plus x1 times y1. So here's where we would use the binary transform reduce. So we've got two input sequences. So we've got this left input sequence here, the x's, and this right input sequence here, the y's. And then this is our transform op, so it's gonna multiply the x and the x and y elements together from the, the consecutive uh, element pairs. And then we've got just about zero for our initial value for the reduction, and then we have the reduction op, op here, which again is just addition. Note that you do actually have to write the reduction op and the initialization here because they do not have a default value in the current spec. I see some hands. All right, I'm gonna go here, then here.
So, so, so you're, you're asking whether you can, whether you can do a, a binary transform reduce on two input sequences of different types? I believe the answer to that is no. I would have to check the wording, but I'm pretty sure that the way that reduction operators are normally uh, sort of worded, it's that they have to take, they have to take arguments of the same type. Because otherwise, you, you could use it to reduce the, the elements, but you couldn't use it to reduce the reductions themselves. So it has to be the same type, otherwise you would need a separate operation to be able to combine the reductions. So sort of, to make that a little bit clearer, let me go back a couple slides. So like here, like if this, if pretend that this was some second sequence here, and that you wanted, like this was complex, this was a second sequence, this was a Y, and this was a, a complex, and this was double, then you might want your reduce op here to take a double and a complex, but then this reduce op doesn't work, because this one is expecting two, the results of these two um, uh, computations there. So that's why we don't have, that's why it, you have to have the same input type for the sequence. All right, okay, so there's another question over here. Um, let's see, your y vector is shorter than the x vector. Um, I feel, I feel like there's probably a requires clause that says that the y has to be larger than, than the, the x and that it, you just get ub if you break that requires clause. Um, that, that, that would be my guess off the top of my head, but I would have to check. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's just, that it's just one of the requirements, of the, uh, one of the preconditions of the function. Um, yeah, if it's greater than, it, it will just only process up for the for the for the um, the uh, range of the first element. Yeah, yeah. This is the, and this is the same way that the um, the uh, non-parallel algorithms do things too. Yeah. So, so the comment was that he he believes there's a proposal to the to the uh, committee in flight to deprecate versions of algorithms that um, specify some ranges, some some sequences as two iterators and some as just one, and make some assumptions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I think I've seen that. That's a good idea. Um, it's not something that's in flight for 17, since the the, the train is shipped for 17. But that it would almost certainly be applied to these parallel algorithms, anyways. Um, another thing I should mention, some of the orders of, of parameters for transform reduce in particular um, doesn't really match what the order is for inner product. So there's a chance that some of the orders of, param of, our, of parameters and the numbers might change in the future um, for reasons like that as well. All right, any other questions at this point in time? Okay, all right. So we went through this dot product. Um, okay, so there's another way to write dot product which is uh, to use this, something like a boost counting iterator. So a boost counting, counting iterator is iterate over some sequence of numbers. So saying like boost counting iterator zero to x dot size says like I want to iterate over all of the indices in this range here. And so the, the idea here is that, that we want to write something where instead of working with uh, the elements themselves in our transform function, we want to get the index. There's a number of reasons that this might be useful. It comes up a lot in uh, like scientific codes or maybe you want to like apply a stencil. And so this, this is how you can do it. It's a pretty cool trick. It comes up in a few places. And this is kind of nifty. It, it lets you write um, this dot product with the urinary transform reduce. So this is actually also the more frequent example of, of or one of the more frequent ways that you'd see an example of a transform reduce. You also might see like a zip iterator for how you would use an urinary transform reduce. Um, with, uh, to do a dot product with an urinary transform reduce. But the, the proper way to do it is with the binary version, which is, I'm gonna try very hard to make sure it gets into the 17 standard. All right. Okay, so next we're gonna, so I have sort of two lengthier examples here. And so if you get lost at any point during the lengthier examples, just raise your hand and, okay.
Um, the question is, are there requirements on the iterator types? Um, there are requirements in the iterator types. There are also lots of requirements on any, so there's these things called element access functions. Element access functions are any iterators, basically any user code that might be used by an algorithm. So any iterator operations that might be used by an algorithm, any operations on the elements, um, of sequences that are that are uh, required by the algorithm, any of the user-defined functions, so like your reduction ops, your transform ops, your opt to for each, those are we call those element access functions, and there are restrictions on them. Um, basically, the restrictions are you 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 can't do things that would cause data races. Let's see, am I am I good now? All right, cool. So basically, it's it's um, you can't do things that cause data races. I don't actually have um, a slide with the particular restrictions uh, handy, so I can't really tell you uh, what the exact requirements are. But um, you can't use something like an like an iterator from an I/O stream as an as an input to, to any of the parallel algorithms because that that would break because there's there would be these loop carry dependencies between each different iteration. Um, but yes, there are there are those restrictions there, um, and it's certainly something to look up in, in uh, the documentation before using uh, any of these algorithms. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to this, this example? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to write a parallel word count using, of course, transform reduce because that's the only, the only thing that you would ever need. So our goal here is to count the number of word beginnings in the input sequence. All right, so first we need some way of figuring out what a, what a uh, word beginning is. So we're going to use this function here. So what this function does is, is it takes two uh, consecutive elements of, an, of a, some sequence, and it returns true if the second element is the beginning of a word. And so the test for that is if the left character here is a space and the right one is not, then we've reached a new word here. All right, so we've got this function here. We're going to set it aside for a moment. So we go back here, all right, so trivial case, if, if the input string is empty, we don't have any words, so we just return zero. And then because of the way we wrote this, we said that it's going to detect that the second element is the beginning of the word. We, we have a little problem if we're going to use this, which is that if the first character in, in the sequence um, is not a space and it's the beginning of a word, and we're not going to pick up on it because our function only tests whether the second element, the second of two consecutive elements is a beginning of a word, and there's no element that's to the left of the first element. So we need to count the, f we need to check the first character separately. And so we just see is the first character a space? If it, if it um, is, a, if it's not a space, then uh, it's the beginning of a word, and so we count it. And if it is a space, then we don't count it. All right. So then, as I said, we're going to use transform reduce here. We're going to use the binary transform reduce because. We've got this binary function that we're going to apply as a transformation. Um, but we've only got one input sequence. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct these two subsequences from the input here. So the left one is the element, all of the elements in S except for the last element. The right sequence is all of the elements in S except for the first element. And what this is going to give us is um, what we wanted, which is these element pairs of consecutive elements. So in particular, we're going to get, like, you can see it here, S, we're going to get S0 and, and S1 as the first element pair. And then we're going to get S1 and S2 as the second element pair. Now this, this might look a lot like what a reduction looks like, because reductions are also applied to consecutive elements. The difference here is that there's overlap. So this operation that we're doing here, like our reduction would be like S0 and S1, then S2 and S3. Whereas this here, we have the overlap. So like we're, we're applying a, a, a stencil almost here. All right, so we've got this. And then is word beginning is what we're going to use. And, and so it returns 1 whenever we hit a new word, and it returns 0 otherwise. And then our reduction operator is, again, just going to be addition. And the initial value is going to be 0. OK, so what does this actually sort of look like in process? So we've got some input sequence here. And then we've got this, I'm going to call it a pseudo sequence because it's not something that's real. It doesn't actually have storage anywhere. It's built on the fly. But we've got this post transform pseudo sequence that gets created by applying the transform function to these two subsequences that we've created. Note that the first, that this is one shorter than the input here. The first element we've skipped over here. 
OK, so what do we have in this post-transform sequence? Well, we have zeros for all the things that are not the beginning of words, and then we have ones for all the things that are the beginning of words. And so then the reduction goes and adds up all of these ones here, and hey, we have one of these for every word. So now we've counted the number of words that we have. So this is what it looks like. And also, one thing we can do, we can actually take uh, this right here, and we can stick it down in the initial value there, because that's really where it belongs. Because it would be, it's the, this, that's the initial value that gets added up to the sum here. So this is our parallel word count using the C++17 parallel algorithms library. Any questions on this? OK. All right. How are we doing on time? I'm having trouble reading that. 15 minutes? All right. That's good. That's just about as much content as we have left. All right, so our next example is very sort of similar. We're going to create a sparse histogram. So a sparse histogram is a mapping of all of the unique elements in a sequence um, to the number of times that the element appears in the sequence. So this is something that's best understood through an example. So like I've got this input sequence here, A, B, C, C, A, A, B, 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 E. So how many unique keys do we have or unique elements do we have? Well, we have four. And so then what we want as an output is we want that, the list of unique elements, and then we want another list of what, how many times those unique elements show up. So it's, it's called sparse here as, as opposed to a dense. So a dense histogram would have a D in this list here because it's, it's D, and then the count for D would be zero. It is dense through the entire um, min-max range of the keys in the input sequence. All right, so this is our, what our sparse histogram function is going to look like. Um, it, it's going to return a tuple of two vectors. I guess it could return a map, but I really like vectors because um, I program on hardware that really likes uh, structive array layouts as opposed to array of structs. So I don't, and I don't want to use a map here. So we're going to return a tuple of two vectors. And those vectors are going to be, the first one's going to be the, the keys, and then the second one's going to be the count here. All right, so again, first thing is just, you know, if we're empty, we're done. We'll just return these two things here. And they'll, they will be empty. They will have nothing in them. All right, so then what we need to do first is we need to sort the input sequence so that all the equal elements are together. We'll use the parallel algorithm library again for this. So just to sort par on seek, pretty straightforward. All right. Then the next thing we need to do is count the number of unique elements. So this is basically the same as counting the number of, of words. So we're going to use transform reduce. So this is what we've got. So again, we're using the um, binary version of transform reduce. We're doing the same trick that we did before, where we're creating these two subsequences from this initial input sequence here, where one of them's got everything but the last one of element, one of them's got everything but the first element. And then we're going to apply um, this uh, transform op here, which is very similar to our is word beginning operator, where it's going to return one if the second consecutive element is a new unique element. And because we've sorted it, we know that if the left is not equal to the right, then we found the next one that's not, um, that's not unique. That, that is unique, rather, sorry. And so the reduction is a little bit different here because um, we know that we have at least one unique key minimum. And again, just as with, with the word count problem, we would have not counted that key because this uh, transform up here, it's going to tell us whether the right element is a new unique element. So it would miss the first one because there's nothing to the left of the first element. So we need to count that first one. And since we know x isn't empty, we, we just assume that it's, that it's there. OK, and so then we're going to allocate our storage and our, uh, our keys and counts based on that number of unique elements. And then now we're, now we're driving off into the land of things that are not in the standard yet, but um, hopefully will be, which is we're going to use this thing called reduce by key. Um, now, I could write this without reduce by key, but I can't flit it on the slide without reduce by key. Um, so what reduce by key does is it's going to, uh, for every range of consecutive values that share the same key in some two set of uh, key value sequences, it will do a reduction on, on, on that consecutive range. So we've got is two input sequences, a key sequence, and a value sequence. So it'll go through and it'll find, so oh, all these keys here are, are equal. So then for the corresponding value elements, I'm going to go and do the reduction on that, and then go find for the next keys how many of these keys are equal, and do the reduction on that. 
And so unlike a regular reduce, which just gives you back one value, this is going to potentially reduce to, to multiple values because it's just reducing on subsequences. And so instead of having just a return value, it needs to have an output sequence here. And the output sequence, the output key sequence is going to be this histogram keys, and the output count will be the counts. And again, just as with the word count here, um, we'll, we'll, we're just, we're using this const, constant iterator thing here for the, the input value, and that's just an iterator that always returns one. So because we want to count each one of the um, input elements um, once. So then what this will give us as the output is exactly what we need. All right, any questions on this? And this is, this is something that's in HPX and Thrust and Boost Compute if you want to play around with this. And there's a whole bunch of other useful um, by key algorithms. Um, I think these are, are some of the most likely things to go into like the, the next version of a parallelism TS. Um, they're particularly useful if you're dealing with, if you want to, if you want to work with uh, structs of array, uh, yeah, array, struct of array versus instead of working with array of struct. Was there a question back there? Yeah. Um, that's so. The question was, uh, do I have a version that doesn't have so much false sharing problems? Um, me talking about false sharing would be a whole different talk. So we should probably take that offline. Um, but yeah. Um, the answer is yes, but we should we should talk about that later. All right. Okay. All right. So um, now I get to talk about the 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 part of the current parallelism stuff that I'm very directly responsible for, and I don't say that necessarily in a good way, um, which is the parallel algorithm exception handling. So uh, uh, me and JF Bastian wrote a paper for the last committee meeting called Hotel Parallelifornia. The, the punchline is uh, you can throw any time you like, but the exceptions can never leave. The reason for this is that if we have exceptions boiling out of our element access functions, uh, it makes it very, very, very difficult to vectorize them efficiently because then we have to mask because of the possibility of control flow. Um, so this is very problematic. Um, one like on, on a GPU, basically the, the approach would have been like, you know, like check the, analyze the element access functions. If any of them could throw exceptions, run it on serial. Would have been the implementation if we had gone with any error reporting mechanism that doesn't call terminate here. So this is, I think, a good solution for now, which is that if an, if an element access function throws an uncaught exception, std terminate gets called. You're just done. Um, now it also could uh, throw bad alloc if, um, memory is needed for, uh, you know, like a thread pool or, or, or uh, if it's temporary memory resources are needed for the algorithm. Um, but that's a much less common case. All right, so there's that. Sorry, or thanks, depending on your viewpoint. <laughs> or you're welcome, rather. All right, okay, so, so the stuff in this slides, um, almost none of this was code that I wrote. It was almost all code that I stole from other people, and these are the people and things that I stole it from. Um, so they should get the credit for that. Um, so there's a couple things I didn't talk about, uh, which is future directions. So there's three big ones I sort of want to briefly mention. The first is asynchronous versions of the parallel algorithms. So like right now, one of the issues is that if you're using multiple parallel algorithms, like I'm, I'm, doing, uh, I'm doing a sort here, I've got a transform reduce here, I've got a reduced by key here. This is all fork join parallelism. Going, hey, go split up all these tasks, go do stuff, then get, then communicate back together. There's no way for us to overlap computation with the current uh, parallel parallel algorithms. It would be very nice if we had versions which return, which were asynchronous and would return a future that would be ready when the algorithm had finished executing. Yes, question there. Um, you could, I just think that you you could, but um, I think realistically. There's going to be um, performance opportunities that will be lost if we don't have the library um, uh, interfaces for this. Um, I'd have to talk with Hartmut to determine whether or not that's correct, but I'm pretty sure that you actually want the library to provide you with the asynchronous version instead of you just um, wrapping it in some asynchrony prim primitive. It's just like with the fused algorithms. I think I believe there's going to be um, opportunities there to. Uh, uh, optimize by having by knowing that you're doing that you, you're doing this asynchronously. Okay, question over there. Uh, 
Okay, so the question was, how does this compare to Microsoft's parallel STL? Um, so I should give the brief history of parallel STLs, which is that there's been about a million of them. Um, they've all kind of done similar things. I haven't looked at Microsoft's parallel STL in particular, um, but usually they've, they've done very similar sorts of things um, in that they tried to parallelize sequence algorithms. So I, I, I'm not, I can't really answer your question properly because I haven't looked at it, but I would guess it's pretty close. All right, so the, the, the other uh, two things I wanted to briefly mention. So one of the thing that you may have noticed is missing is that there's no way to ask for vectorization without parallelization. Um, so don't worry, we have top men working on that. So there's a proposal for this thing called for loop and for this whole uh, 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 framework, theoretical framework for reasoning of, for and wording um, uh, just vectorization for this for loop construct. It's very powerful, it's a wave front model. Um, and uh, Pablo is gonna be giving a talk about this later in the week. It's, I can't remember the name, but it's something vectorization in C++. You guys should go there, it's really great. Um, there's uh, also some, some so, so there's some algorithms that are like missing, like the, the by key stuff. There's a couple others that, that I think we could really benefit from having uh, in the spec here. So that's sort of the future direction. Oh, and I forgot, of course, there's executors, which are a whole talk in and of themselves. Um, basically, what I, what I, again, what I've shown you here is a way to request parallelism, but I haven't shown you any way to sort of like control how that parallelism may be applied. Executors will give you that. So executors is a way of abstracting execution resources, like thread pools, for example, um, and, or like a uh, accelerator that uh, is attached to your device might be um, abstracted as a uh, executor. So right now the parallel um, algorithms library basically has sort of a, a default implied executor, which is sort of this unspecified thing that whatever your vendor gives you is gonna be. So like NVIDIA's CUDA compiler, the default executor is gonna probably be, um, you know, whatever GPU is on your system. But like what if you have two GPUs and you wanna say run on this GPU or that GPU? Or like with libc++, the, uh, execution, the executor is gonna probably be something that goes to lib, uh, the grand central dispatch. Um, on Linux, with, with libstud c++, it'll probably be some thread pool built on top of pthreads. With something like HPX, it's, it's very lightweight tasking. Um, and so executors are gonna give us a way to, to add a lot of the controls that you might want to uh, the parallel algorithms. All right, so I think I've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, so I, I think it would be easiest if we maybe do a line at one of these microphones here because it's very difficult for me to see who has hands up with the lights here. Okay, so yeah, yeah, just, just. All right, go ahead. Executor default policy, can you actually suggest that you want to use all, all types of uh, hardware po uh, threads or hardware pools such as GPUs, CPUs, FPGAs simultaneously to perform on your algorithm? Um, so you're the, right now, the question was whether, whether you can request to use all, hard, all the possible hardware available um, uh, with the default executor. Right now you can't, right now the um, executor is something that the implement is, is not in the language of the spec anywhere and it's just an implied concept that it's completely up to your implementation how the, how the parallelism is provided. So right now, no, there's not a way to add that, but we have top guys on it and that's coming in the future. All right. So did par unsec used to be called par vec? Yes, it did. Um, this is like if const expert. So you probably have heard about a thing called const expert if because everybody in the committee has gotten used to calling it const expert if. And we static can, if. Or, yeah, or static if. But const expert if is a particularly bad one because the actual thing is spelled in code if const expert. And everybody calls it const expert if. Yeah, par vec, it used to be, or par and seek used, let's see, I'm doing it myself. Par and seek used to be called par vec. It got renamed to be um, uh, par and seek. Because those, the execution policy identifiers are very short, they got bike shedded many, many, many times. They were gonna live in a separate namespace at one point. Seek was gonna be sequence at one point. Um, they were gonna be longer, they were gonna be shorter. Uh, this is this is what we ended up with, but yes, that that is how they they, they mapped. Yeah. I have one more question, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it builds on the person's last question about using uh, 
the begin and end of the destination iterator. Yeah. And there's a STL has a, a paper on that. But since we're adding uh, transform reduce, so we have control over that now. So why not add that safety feature now? Because we don't really have control over it because the committee draft is, has fixed. Um, the only okay. possible changes right. that could be made to transform reduce is if um, the committee decides that uh, the current we're, the current uh, uh, missing transform reduce overload um, should be there and that the inner product overload for execution policies that is there shouldn't be there, then we might have some freedom there. But it's not something that we could really fix in ballot comments. Sure. I'm hoping to at least fix the order of parameters in transform reduce, but that may be a little out there. Um, if you set up a um, vectorized uh, execution policy, but then the operations that you sent to it are not capable of being vectorized. Bad stuff happens. So does it cause a compiler error or does it cause a runtime error? It does not cause a compiler error. Okay. It, causes, it does not cause a runtime error. It causes undefined behavior. Ah, okay, thank you. Yes. All right, any other questions? All right, well, I hope you guys have a great conference. We're really glad to have you here. And uh, I'll see you guys all around. <laughs>